everybody. Just so you know. Thank you for taking such an interest in staying alive. My first book, The Zombie Survival Guide, came out in 2003, and you will find it in your bookstore's humor section. That was not my idea. <laughs> there is a reason for that, and we will get into that reason later. But let me say right now that I find nothing remotely funny about being killed and eaten by zombies. <laughs> and when I am asked why have I spent such a large chunk of my career writing about the living dead, my answer is, they scare me. <laughs> But the long answer is that zombies do not obey the first law of conventional monsters. And what I mean by that first law is that everything else out there, all other creatures that would kill us, you have to go find. You have to go to the swamp or the desert or the abandoned summer camp. <laughs> and if you do that, I have no sympathy for you. Because then you're not being smart. Then you're just being the crocodile hunter. Oh. dangerous animals that stick. <laughs> that was his choice. Now, had he chosen a safe path, had he been Steve Irwin, the tax attorney, <laughs> and he had been just sitting at home in Australia, just doing whatever Australians do at home, and there'd been a knock at the door, and he'd been like, oh, I'll get it. And he had gone to the door, and there'd been a stingray. <laughs> and he jumped on him and stabbed him in the heart, that would have been a tragedy. <laughs> and that is the problem with zombies. They come to you. Tonight, you can all go home, go to your dorm, and just sit there with your buddies, just chilling out, watching Family Guy, going, oh, look, a non sequitur. And then before you know it, they will come through the doors and the windows. They're coming for you, and they're not just coming for you with ones or twos. They are coming for you in the hundreds, or the thousands, or the millions, or if you live in China or India, in the billions. <laughs> that is why they're so scary, and that is why we need to learn how to survive them. And the first rule is you have to disabuse yourself of all the myths perpetrated by conventional zombie entertainment. What I mean by that is all the stuff that's out there, all the books and TV shows and movies and video games and apps and bumper stickers and t-shirts and all of it. Because their job is not to save your life. Like me. <laughs> their job is to entertain you. Now, are there any creative writing majors here? Okay, none of you. Good. <laughs> You're never going to make money off it anyway. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> what you learn, as I learned, when you study drama, when you study writing, when you study storytelling, is that the point of entertainment is to keep your audience in. Well, what's the first thing you would need in a zombie outbreak? Well, 
well, I need a big gun. This is America, obviously. Duh. <laughs> and I need a tricked out Hummer because I saw the movie where the dude from Cheers had one. <laughs> and I need like, um, um, like a, a jetpack and a lightsaber. <laughs> and I think, yeah, you're gonna die. <laughs> because the problem with zombie survival, as indeed any disaster preparedness, is it's all in the details. And these details may not be exciting and sexy and cool, and they probably wouldn't make it into a movie, but guess what? They will keep you alive. Because the first thing you will need in a zombie outbreak is not a big gun or a tricked out Hummer or a jetpack lightsaber combo. The thing you will need is water. It's not very cool, but guess what? You will not be shooting or driving or jetpack lightsabering every minute of every day. But you will be losing fluid, and if you don't have water, you will die. And I, look, I understand this. I have never seen a zombie movie where someone has died of dehydration. <laughs> Come on, we gotta get out of here, let's go! Oh my god, my head. Oh, I'm so dehydrated. <laughs> no one <more> without me. <laughs> you don't see that, but that's exactly what would happen. And you don't just need water, because we bring, have to bring in another element of reality. You can't carry that much water. The more water you carry, the heavier it is, the more you sweat, the more water you lose. So you need a way of purifying water, because there will be water around, but it may not necessarily be clean. You will need a way to have a source of clean water. And look, I know I can see the looks when I say clean water. Most of you are like, clean water, clean water. I thought, are you talking about like those commercials that I used to see late at night, which would be like a third world kid and my parents would watch them and feel guilty and self-conscious and change the channel? Yes! <laughs> because in America, when the zombies attack, we become the third world country. And not every source of water is going to be clean. And listen, I understand. I've never seen a zombie movie where someone has drank stagnant water and crapped themselves to death. <laughs> but that is exactly what's going to happen. Come on, we got to get out of here. Oh, my God. Oh, I should have drank out of that. <laughs> that will be you. They'll say, oh, what happened to Fred? Oh, he drank out of that puddle. Yeah, he crapped himself to death. Come on, let's go. <laughs> So you need a source of clean water. But I understand this is America. We need to talk about guns. We do. I get it. Statistically, there's more guns in this room than people. All right. <laughs> Here's the thing. Guns don't kill people. And people don't kill people either. I don't care what your uncle's bumper sticker says. <laughs> Bullets are the killer. <laughs> the bullet is the weapon. The gun is just the launcher. So when you think about this, and I knew, I promised it's in my contract, I would have no math in this presentation, but just think about how many bullets you would need versus the amount of zombies you will encounter on your trek across this great land. There are 300 million Americans. I don't know how many Mexicans. <laughs> I'm not being racist. I don't know. I literally just haven't studied. They lot. And I also know there is a hell of a lot more Canadians than they want us to believe. <laughs> so if you put us in North America all together, if you add up the combined population of North America, Americans... Mexicans, snow creatures, and even divide that number in half. That's a hell of a lot more zombies than any amount of ammo you can stuff in your drawers. So you are going to need a hand-to-hand -hand weapon, or what those of you who play World of Warcraft would refer to as a melee weapon. And that's a hope. Who applauded? All right, what? Oh, I can see you from here. What's your name, sir? Taylor. Taylor. That's nice. <laughs> Taylor. Well, Taylor, you probably already have a melee weapon. I'm sure you do. Here's the thing, Taylor. It's not real. It's not going to save your life. And don't tell me it's battle ready. I know the website.
websites, they say that. No, it's Renaissance Fair ready. All right, you take the sword of Gryffindor and you smash it against the tree. It's not going to stand up to punishment. None of them are. They are not made to be used. They are made as display items. And looking out at the crowd, I've, some young ladies are like, well, then why would they buy them? Okay. Good question. Who are the business majors here? Raise your hand. We're not going to protest you. All right. There you go. Two people who have the courage to be like, yes, money. Okay. I understand. What they will tell you is that that melee weapon market, that display item market, is for a targeted demographic. Someone went, mm hmm Yes. <laughs> People like Taylor and many other young men like him. And their goal miss by buying these melee weapons is the hope that someday they'll be able to talk you out of coming out of Comic-Con with them back to their apartment in their mother's basement and show you the sword of Rivendell and say, look, Aragorn. In the hopes that somehow something magical will happen to Taylor. never works. But it doesn't matter. The hope of Taylor and men like him has spurned an industry that rivals the military-industrial complex. <laughs> this country is awash in display items. Now the good news is there actually are real weapons out there that are durable, strong, cheap, and very plentiful. But they're not sold as weapons. Any history majors here? One, one. She's she's a little ashamed of it. I, I've, I've studied history. That's all right. That's all right, man. It's, it's, it's a very noble profession. Here, I'll help you get a job. Uh, hold the mail. I, I was a history major too. I mean, come on. It's not like it's going to repeat itself. What's your name? Basil. All right. What Basil will tell you is that weapons a long time ago, long time ago, were not invented as weapons. They were invented as tools. What Basil will tell you is that throughout most of our history, a lot of people with a little bit of stuff that they owned had to go fight for a little bit of people who owned everything else. And unless you lived in a society like ancient Rome where they made weapons for you and they said, here's a sword, go die. <laughs> you had to use whatever tools you had at your disposal. Whatever you were working with, that became your weapon. And eventually, sometimes they morphed into actual weapons over time. Nobody ever invented the battle axe. They invented the axe. And a long time ago, in the ancient primeval fjords of Norway, the Bjorn Bjornson, he was chopping a tree, and his friend Sven Svensson said, Bjorn, we have to go on a raid to the western shore. <laughs> and Bjorn didn't have a weapon. He said, Oh, I don't have a weapon. Oh, I can't convict you. Oh, Odin's balls. <laughs> 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 and Sven said, oh, careful, Bjorn, you're going to hurt someone with that. And Bjorn said, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the battle axe was born. <laughs> so, Taylor, the moral of the story is, if you want a battle axe, go down to Lowe's and get an axe. And if you want a scimitar, go get a machete. And if you want a dwarven mithril maul, you get a sledgehammer. <laughs> the weapons are out there. So now that we've covered weapons, we have to cover the other great American icon, which is the automobile. We love them. They're amazing. We don't build them anymore, but we still love to drive them. <laughs> and look, I understand. I love them too. Did anybody see the 2004 movie Dawn of the Dead? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. I love the scene where they took the airport shuttle bus and they turned it into an armored personnel carrier. And that scene meant a lot to me because when I was your age, I got to watch a scene like that every week. 
where there was a team of guys and they did that every week and one of them said shut up fool and the music went da 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 so wow I was thrilled here's the thing someone was like he met the A team <laughs> the problem is that who here in this room is a licensed mechanic None of you. Okay. And I bet none of you know how many parts there are in the average internal combustion engine. Neither do I. But I will tell you, it only takes one to break, and then you are all out of luck. Now, if you somehow manage to find a car that never breaks, like something Japan used to make in the 80s, it doesn't matter. Guns need bullets. Cars need gas. Now, where I'm from in L.A., we all drive hybrids. <laughs> because we care. And I know here, too, you grow a lot of ethanol. I've seen it. I've been driving by where they're like, quick, we're growing ethanol to get us self-independent from oil. Get some more petroleum fertilizer on there. <laughs> I get it. But it doesn't matter if it's flex or hybrid. You'll just go twice as far and then die. <laughs> because with all our amazing technology, we still have yet to invent a car that runs on fear. <laughs> and until they do that, how about a bicycle? Yeah, so one person. Yeah. <laughs> because it is light. It is easy to repair. If you run up against a barrier, like a police barricade, you just pick it up, carry it with you, and today it is the only vehicle that runs on fear. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got... What? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah. That's <laughs> Strength and silence, just like you business majors out here. I'm not saying I'm a business major. <laughs> we have our vehicles, and we have our weapons, and we have our way to make clean water. Where do we go? Well, this is a problem, and I want you to get away from what you might think of this first thought. Uh, for example, look, I'm from a very densely populated area. I'm from Los Angeles, and I came here, and initially my first thought was, wow, there's no people around. <laughs> no. 300 million Americans. Don't think you're going into the wilderness because when those 300 million Americans spread out from the cities and search for food, there's not going to be any wilderness anymore. They're going to eat everything. And then they're going to eat each other because that's the way it works. So what you have to do to find your part of this planet, where you think you will be safe, where you will go, is open a map of the world, find America on it, and if you can do that, you're ahead of the national statistic. <laughs> wow. I didn't make that up. <laughs> then you look at where all the people are on this planet. Where is the population density? When you look at that, you will realize that's where the living is good. That's where there's good land, good climate, easy access to fresh water. That's where our ancestors came around and said, Okay, well here. I'll take it. Or I'll take it from someone else. <laughs> that's where the people are, that's where the zombies are gonna start. So you need to look at a part of this planet which you would never want to go because it is way too hot or way too cold or way too many jungly fire anti. And <laughs> that is where you need to go. And in order to do that. You have to do something which is very, very un-American. So there'll be time for questions in a minute, sir. You want to go to 29 Palms? You don't want to go. Sir, there's Marines there. You'll be fine. And you got a pretty mouth. Anyway. Oh. You want to go someplace. And therefore, you will have to do something, as I said, which is very un-American, which is going native. And I know that's weird. What I mean is... Even in these sparsely populated parts of the planet, there's always a few groups there, and somehow they've managed to survive. And you will need to listen to them and learn from them, because somehow they beat the elements. They beat the kind of climate that will kill you faster than any zombie. He was so good at it, 
They brought him back 20 years later. Rambo 4, the search to kill more Asian people. <laughs> now, they have yet to make Rambo 5, the battle with testicular cancer. <laughs> yes, because that movie's a little different. See, that movie would start with him in the shower going, there's a lump down there. <laughs> and then, it doesn't matter that Rambo can sew his own wound up because that wound, he can't sew up on his own. Rambo needs Dr. Schlossenstein. And Dr. Schlossenstein is perhaps not so good with an M60. Maybe can't stand up under torture and maybe can't knock a Soviet helicopter gunship out of the sky with a homemade bow and arrow. But man, the Schloss knows his ball cancer. <laughs> because the Schloss is what you call a specialist. And that is the reason we're all here tonight in our artificial cave, under our artificial sun, in our artificial summer, and the saber-toothed cat, and the giant jaguar, and the short-faced bear, who all used to treat us like Slim Jims, are now in a museum, sucking it. <laughs> we specialized. A long time ago, our ancestors got together, and they said, Oh my God, what? You can throw a spear better than anybody. That's amazing. Don't do anything else. No, 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 no. Just put down everything and put down the rocks. You're the spear thrower. That's what you do. You're going to do it all day. And you, oh my God, you know how to take grass and like weave it in the basket so we can like put stuff in it and go from point A to point B. That's amazing. You're, you're going to weave baskets. Oh my God, that's all you do. Put down a spear. And you, oh my God, you told us because there was a lightning strike over there that somehow we need to give you all of our virgins. Okay, you'll be the priest. <laughs> <laughs> that is how we've gotten here by specializing and that is what you will have to do before the zombie plague happens don't try it on Z day one because that's one test you cannot cram for so start looking around start figuring out you know who is like a useful skill like oh wow you study engineering that's cool and you study philosophy anyway let's go <laughs> Figure out the useful skills. And ladies, there'll be a lot of men coming up to you, asking you to join their group, and not necessarily vetting your skill set. Just to be, yes, exactly, she said just say no. Exactly, that's what we say in the 80s, just say no. Especially if they're freshmen. Oh, no, freshmen. Fresh boys, listen. I was one once, I, I was a freshman once, and I was... Yeah, listen. If you see a zombie that maybe a few days before was a hot girl, just don't. Right? Don't. I get it. I know where you're coming from. Don't. But this is important also. It's not just enough to vet skill set. You also have to vet personality. Because you want people to mesh. You want to see, can someone stand up under stress? And can you all work together as a cohesive group? Does this person want what you want? And look, like I said, I was a freshman. I remember, oh my God, I, my first days in college in 1990, I was like, oh man, I'm so scared because I'm looking at myself. Oh, hey, how you doing, man? Oh, do you like Kurt Cobain too? Me too. Oh, he's going to be singing for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, too soon? <laughs> Yeah, you make your friends and you think, oh, we just clicked. You get on your phone with your parents, you're like, oh, I met all these group of friends and we just clicked. Oh my God, it's so awesome. Oh my God, oh my God. And then, like, six to eight months later, you're like, wow, you're really not into hygiene, are you? <laughs> okay. But it took you six to eight months to figure it out, right? Now, on college campuses, at least above the Mason Dixon line, you have a natural resource called alcohol. <laughs> and no, that's good. Because you call it alcohol, I call it getting to know you on fast forward. <laughs> because that it speeds up the vetting process you meet someone with a good skill set you're like oh this person might be cool in my group and they seem cool enough you invite them over to your dorm room you get them drunk put on a controversial movie and halfway through if they say well I can see Ike's point of view Tina was kind of asking for it then you know <laughs> out <laughs> She gets it. <laughs> would it 
be beneficial to go north? Well, sir, north is a very general term. Uh, yeah, I, look, yes, I, the answer is yes and maybe. That, that's the answer. Because yes, and the zombies do freeze. So at least you'd have the winter to survive and live on whale blubber. And you know, then no. when the snows melt, you're like, okay, let's go bust some heads. But when you say north, do you mean Siberia? Because if you go there, like I said, you better go native. You better understand who these people are, okay? They're Russians. And they're not Russians from the 80s where you can just bring them blue jeans. And they go, oh, spasiba, tovare. And you're like, oh, you only have 3G. You don't come in. And don't for a second think about going to Canada. Because what we call the great zombie plague, they call the great payback. And on Z Day 1, sorry, he asked, what if there were zombie runners? <laughs> well, sir, then we would just stomp on them with our imperial walkers. <laughs> <laughs> State or D.C.? This is Washington State. Oh, great. So you're fleeing from zombies and going to Sasquatch country. Awesome. You go, dude. Anyone else? Yes, sir. What? Would it be possible? Well, this gentleman asked, well, what if I would secure an island on a lake in Minnesota? Do you have an island lake in mind? Okay, sir, so you're assuming. Now, you look like a generation who's probably taught, sir, when you assume, you make an ass of you and me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 